everyone, I'm your host PensyFan19 and welcome to the November 2020 PensyFan Periodical. This is a monthly news series which covers most of the major railroading headlines from around the world, as well as my opinions on them. We have a lot of articles to go over today, so with that in mind, let's get rolling. First on the list, might as well recognize that Joe Biden won the presidential election! I'm sorry to all my Trump fans out there, I respect your opinions. Please don't unsubscribe since Biden has had much experience negotiating with the railroads. Amtrak and many Class 1s are welcoming Biden and his plans for rail infrastructure in the U.S. In fact, the U.S. High Speed Rail Association has created a five-point plan for Biden's rail-based administration, which includes an entire list of regions to get billions of dollars of investment. According to this plan, the top five high-speed rail priorities include $60 billion for California high-speed rail, which should cover most of the $80 billion price tag of the project, followed by $20 billion for the Texas high-speed rail, which, if referring to Texas Central, I thought they were privately funded. Third in line is $50 billion for improvements along the Northeast Corridor, including the Gateway Tunnels, which are in desperate need of funding and repair. $40 billion for Cascadia High-Speed Rail Service between Portland, Oregon and Vancouver. Again, I thought Microsoft or another private company would be funding that. And lastly, only $2.5 billion for Tampa to Orlando High-Speed Rail. I feel that this route is, one, more of a commuter route than a high-speed rail system by itself, and two, already taken by the privately funded Bright Line, which is planned to extend the tempo with a new stop at Disney World! Woo! Then the agency lists a lot more routes to be given somewhere between 8 to 40 billion in funding, mainly between underutilized cities in the Midwest and Western portions of the nation. Even though I support private companies such as Brightline running high-speed corridors due to government-owned rail operations being complicated in terms of funding and support, I feel that if done correctly and with enough support from the government and citizens of the US, these underrated rail corridors could finally be given the attention they deserve and bring much more economic development in these regions which haven't seen frequent passenger service in decades. In the meantime, after numerous complaints of Amtrak's long-distance trains being slow and delayed by freight operators for having track ownership, the FRA has ruled that the Class 1 freights can be fined for delaying Amtrak trains. Even though I feel the passenger trains should always have the right of way in any operation, I don't feel that fining the freight roads for existing is the best solution to this problem. Instead, as I mentioned in the June 2020 Pensy Fan periodical, there should be another track added in areas where there is plenty of room to do so, such as the once four tracks, now double tracked ex New York Central and ex Illinois Central main lines, and most of the planes along the ex Santa Fe, ex Great Northern, and ex Rio Grande main lines for better flow of all traffic on the routes. Or better yet, transfer the passenger operations to either the freight railroad, so this way they would automatically have right away over freight services, and for the freight railroad, or to entirely new private operators, such as Brightline, who can negotiate with the freight railroads for passenger priority. In this way, if Amtrak is separated to numerous privately owned divisions, similar to the privatization of Japan National Railways back in 1987, each company can focus on maintaining, improving, and introducing new passenger service in that specific region instead of the entire national rail network. While we're focusing on the United States, Amtrak has named Stephen Gardner as the new president of Amtrak, while Flynn is still the CEO. Two ballots for rail transportation have been passed for the election, while two have failed. Metro has converted the Pullman bi-level gallery car into a bike car, always finding ways to put historic passenger cars into good use. The CSX Heritage Caboose has been spotted with the SpaceX launch. Pacific Parlor Cars Santa Lucia Highlands and Samoa Valley have been spotted on the back of a Texas Eagle head to the Dallas Terminal. Montana Rail Link has released a Veterans Unit, which looks very similar to Kansas City Southern's Veterans Unit. Moynihan Station is set to open in January 2021. BNSF has claimed first comments on railway age. And South Carolina-based Optifuel wants to convert locomotives with natural gas-powered locomotives, including converting SW1500s into- Oh no. Look what they want to do with the switcher. Look what they did to my boy. Keep in mind, this is also the same company that made this a few years ago. Personally, not a fan of the design, but it's a natural gas-powered diesel locomotive, so hopefully that can reduce emissions and encourage a switch to environmentally friendlier engines. Speaking of which, here's some interesting news. A whale sculpture has saved a commuter train in the Netherlands from falling over the edge, with the event turning into a meme. Deutsche Bahn has joined the U.S. High Speed Rail Association. The Festinian Railway is to complete an underframe for the Blackpool tram. All Northern Class 142s have been retired and are being put to good use, such as Kirk Merrington Primary School in Spennymoor, converting one of these spaces into a school library. 
Four GEP42s have been spotted leading a Lakeshore Limited in Elkhart, Indiana, while the Capital Limited only has four coaches. Someone left a door open on a grain hopper in the same town. Colorado Pacific is willing to run regular passenger service on the Tennessee Pass in Colorado for the first time in decades. Virgin Hyperloop has tested their Hyperloop in Nevada. Chinese high-speed trains have joined an express delivery service for online shoppers. The closure of the Mikajiri line has ended the movement of all coal by rail in Japan. Costco is now selling membership for private jet rentals. The European Union has declared 2021 the year of rail. TX Logistic has a fiery new livery. Amtrak has proposed a regional route to Scranton along the same route of NJT's proposed and delayed Lackawanna cutoff. The Wiscasset, Waterville, and Farmington has received a maintenance tamper from an Australian sugar company. A skeleton has demanded a shrubbery. And Pacific Harbor Line has ordered a battery-powered progress rail switcher. This railroad has tested a few low-emission locomotives before, but I never expected them to use this one. I'm personally not a fan of the locomotive since it looks a bit odd with its low height and six axles spreading throughout the whole frame. Maybe if it was a bit taller and had four axles it would look normal, but that's only my opinion on the matter. Meanwhile, CN has released two veterans units to honor American and Canadian veterans, and the railroad has officially released their fight with what? Just five heritage units? Only representing railroads which CN acquired since their privatization in 1995? Nothing else from the list we saw months ago? Oh, okay. That makes sense. I'll just go cry in a corner now. Well, since we only have four GVOs and two SD70s, might as well go over my ratings of these main heritage units from most to least favorite. One, two, three, four, five, negative seven. I'm sorry, CM, but how does this qualify as a heritage unit? It's just the current railroad's livery with the CN25 sticker on the side. This would be considered a sticker unit rather than a full-on heritage unit like the R5 shown earlier. But this story isn't over yet, as CN GP40 number 7601 has been repainted into an Illinois Central Heritage livery, along with Slug 601 as an additional heritage unit, the 7600 and its slug counterpart, and do not seem to be part of the official CN25 program. Since 7600 was painted in CN's original green and yellow livery, and is not represented in the CN25 heritage fleet, there's a good chance that the list of proposed heritage liveries could still be applied to rebuilt jeeps and slugs, mainly at the Progress Trail Tacoma shops. In other news, Chad Pacific is using two snowplows on each end to clear the tracks of the Canadian snowfall. Ontario Southland has placed their RS-18 back in service and repainted their SW-1200. YouTube has cancelled Rewind 2020. MTR in Hong Kong has placed their LRVs in the service. The Minsk Metro inaugurated their Line 3 while the Bucharest Metro in Romania has purchased also the Metropolis subways for their Line 5. Norfolk Southern has consolidated its operating divisions from 9 to 6. Kenya Railways has introduced new DMUs for Nairobi Commuter Service. Trenitalia has received single-level DMUs from Hitachi. And DLR has released the concept art of their new CAF units, which appears to be slanted in the head-on view. Meanwhile in Germany, the city of Cologne has ordered 64 Citadis trams, while Baden-Württemberg has identified 42 lines which can be reopened for multiple unit service, Siemens has delivered bi-level Desirio EMUs for Israeli railways, and has unveiled their Miro Smart EMU. Talgo is set to release a hydrogen power tram by 2023, North Milan Railways is to receive hydrogen power trains from Alstom, Linsinger has revealed a hydrogen power milling machine, while Hexagon Purus has delivered cylinders for hydrogen power trains in the US, most likely for the Arrow commuter route, and Railways News has claimed that hydrogen is a distraction, since electric power is more efficient. Because of this, I predict there will be a rivalry among railway companies between hydrogen and electric power trains. Now there's the sad news. The pandemic is resulting in numerous budget cuts and deficits for passenger railroads nationwide, including Amtrak, DC Metro, the New York MTA, Chicago CTA, BANYNJ, and MBTA as they are forced to make drastic cuts in service frequencies in order to save money for budgets for the next few years. The introduction of the new Golden Pass Express train sets has also been postponed, which has a beautifully modern and sleek design. Brightline West has been postponed due to the poor market only days after advertising for the route. The Manchester United B-17 project has been cancelled as its part have been donated to other B-17 projects. DC Metro is temporarily withdrew there are 6,000 series rail cars from service after two of them uncoupled. And Baby Shark just passed Despacito with more than 7 billion views. 
Now here's the follow-up news section for articles covering stories from previous episodes. First off, the Revolution Very Light Rail Vehicle has been delivered to the Clinton Rail Technology Center for testing. Seriously though, we need one of these for the US. There are thousands of branch lines which could be reactivated with this rail car, or something like it. CSX is planning on acquiring Pan Am Railways, with Norfolk Southern objecting the proposal with the STB. MDOT and private contractors have settled their dispute over the Purple Line project. C2C has launched a real-time train tracker. British Rail Class 484s have arrived on the Isle of Wight. Webtech Flex Drive has been delivered to Southern California for testing with BNSF. Colorado's Pikes Peak Railway sits to receive small diesel locomotives and snowblowers from Stadler. And NJTF 40PH-2 cats have re-re-entered service. While the railroad is currently the only one which still has a fully implemented PTC with over 200 miles to go. Even though NJT is projected to meet the due date, they have increased testing again and has even led to tests such as these, including the ALP-45 Veterans Unit and my personal favorite NJT Heritage Unit. Not surprising since my name is literally PensyFan19. Up next is the station upgrades portion covering proposals, construction, and openings of stations around the world. For this episode we have Buffalo Exchange Street Station, Burgess Hill, Hoya Loop, Clay St. Henry, Riga, Gatwick Airport, Brattleboro, Vermont, Bangsu Grand Station, Ilford, Middletown, Pennsylvania, and Detroit Central City. Whoa, 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 hold on one second. What is Fort planning to do to the platforms? Why are they turning it into a driving track? Why are they removing any chances of passenger service there by paving it over? In other news, Nelson has completed the first few train sets for Montreal's REM commuter service. Bombardier has produced 14 CR300AF high-speed train sets for Chinese railways. VY is to run passenger service on the Hatranda line for the first time in 30 years. Wuhan has tested a driverless suspended monorail. The Monticello Railway Museum has preserved an Illinois Midland RS-1325 and an Illinois Terminal SW-1200. Congress for New Urbanism is holding a forum to repurpose highways that don't have a future. CTA has won a design award for their Garfield station renovation. Manchester is to receive 27 more M5000 trams. Skoda is to make bi-level push-pull train sets and EMUs for CD. PK Transport is to supply Lion LRVs to Perm and Ishvek. OBB talents have been refurbished for Espon in no uncertain terms. The Canadian Pacific 2816 has been restored for Rail's virtual holiday train. And happy 20th anniversary to the Acela Express. After all that, it is now time for this month's Meme of the Month. This month's Meme of the Month is... Interior Lighting Unit. And now, the top story of the November 2020 Pensy Fan Periodical is... Rocky Mountaineer to introduce Denver to Moab service. This is a huge surprise from the Canadian Luxury Rail Service as they will be providing an excursion service along the former Rio Grande mainline with single level silver leaf cars from Denver westward and onto Union Pacific's Cane Creek branch to Moab, Utah for tourists to travel to Arches National Park for the first time via train. Although this route is ideal for tourist service from a city to a national park, I do feel that the route should at least be extended to Salt Lake City, so that the rail could also serve as an inner city route for passengers who want to travel between the two great cities and pick up passengers along the ex-Rio Grande Main who want to travel to either city, or in this case to Moab. Or at least have a second service from Salt Lake City to Moab, where it can meet up with a Denver to Moab train. But then again, Rocky Mountaineer is a tourist service and focuses more on bringing tourists to scenic locations in North America, and is living up to its name as it travels through the American Rocky Mountains. With this in mind, I'm very interested to see what operations will look like once commenced in August 2021 and what plans they possibly have for the future in America. Thank you everyone for watching this month's episode of Pensy Fan Periodical. There have been a lot of rail news headlines for the month and it will be very interesting to see what the future has in store for all of these articles. Thank you again for watching and if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and like the video. Have a good day.